Dr. Christine DeLong, an Associate Professor in the Department of Geography and Anthropology at Louisiana State University, and I am a paleoclimatologist. I also work with the South Central Climate Science Center. In this video, I will discuss how scientists reconstruct our past climate record for centuries and millennia in the past. How do we know temperatures today are warmer than the distant past when thermometers were not invented yet? This is knowledge that paleoclimatologists like me develop using proxy records from archives. These archives can be living organisms or formations from natural processes like cave deposits, glaciers, and ice sheets. Proxies can be physical properties of an archive, like the width of a tree ring or a chemical property like the strontium to calcium ratio in a skeleton. The key ingredient of an archive is a way to tell time. Some organisms form incremental bands as they grow, like the rings you see in a tree. Large boulder-shaped corals also have density bands visible in x-rays. In fact, clamshells, ear bones of fish, and even your teeth and bones have some sort of bands that are deposited with time. You can determine the year if you know the date the archive was collected and you count the bands to determine the year. For living organisms, this counting method is good back to about 5,000 years, which is the age of the oldest living trees. For other natural archives with layers, like ice cores, scientists count bands or layers back hundreds of thousands of years into the past. Deposits of sediment or mud in lakes, basins, and even the seafloor form layers that stack up with time. If left undisturbed, these sediment deposits can contain long sequence of information that can span millions of years. These sediments contain microfossils of pollen and plankton that live during different time intervals, telling us a lot about our past climate. For archives without layers that can be counted, we use different dating methods, primarily radioactive isotopic dating, such as radiocarbon. With this dating method, we use a process of radioactive decay to determine the age of the sample. Isotopes of an element, like carbon, have the same chemical properties but different masses due to additional neutrons. Some isotopes are stable with time, like carbon-12. Others are unstable and decay with time, like carbon-14. Unstable or radioactive isotopes have a definable half-life in which the radioactive isotope decays into another element or isotope during a specific length of time. For example, carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years and decays into nitrogen-14. By measuring the amounts of the daughter and parent isotopes, you can determine how much time has passed. For some unstable isotopes, you can date an archive back more than a billion years. After we establish the timeline in our archive, paleoclimatologists will look for a proxy in the archive that changes with time due to climatic or environmental changes. For example, a tree that grows in a dry area will change its rate of growth depending on the amount of water available. Faster growing trees will have wider tree rings and slower growing trees will have narrow rings. Thus, these tree rings are a proxy for water availability or precipitation. In ice sheets and glaciers, there are several proxies that tell us about past climate. Cores of ice contain air bubbles that are time capsules of the Earth's past atmosphere. In these bubbles, scientists measure the amount of carbon dioxide from layer to layer. This is how we know the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has changed greatly since the Industrial Revolution and since the last ice age 18,000 years ago. Additionally, the ratio of stable oxygen isotopes in ice, corals, and ocean microfossils all serve as proxies for temperature. In fact, isotopic and elemental ratios in many archives are commonly used as climate proxies because we know that chemical reactions occur under definable conditions such as temperature and pressure. That means our chemistry-based proxies and archives gathered from places worldwide on the land and in the ocean allow paleoclimatologists to determine past temperatures with a precision as good as your household thermometer. Combining proxies from these archives with their timeline, paleoclimatologists develop reconstructions of past climate that can have monthly resolution for some proxy archives and span time intervals from hundreds to millions of years depending on the type of archive. 
Individual archives are combined with other archives from nearby locations up to global scales to better understand past climactic changes. Now that we know how we can create these reconstructions of our past climate, what have paleoclimatologists learned from them? We have learned that the Earth's climate changes naturally on million-year timescales due to the position of the continents and on 100,000-year timescales due to changes in the shape of the Earth's oval orbit around the Sun and the tilt and wobble of the Earth as it rotates on its axis. These changes in the Earth's orbit and rotation caused the recent ice ages that started two million years ago. The last glacial maximum, the coldest part of the last glaciation, climaxed 18,000 years ago when a large two-mile thick ice sheet covered most of North America, with a similar ice sheet covering parts of Europe and Asia. These ice sheets caused global sea levels to drop by 410 feet, exposing the continental shelves. The drop in sea level was large enough for the islands in the western equatorial Pacific to become one landmass, altering ocean circulation in that region. During glacial maximum, global temperatures were colder and ice cores tell us that atmospheric carbon dioxide was 180 parts per million. After the last glacial maximum, atmospheric carbon dioxide increased during a period called the deglacial when continental ice sheets melted over 10,000 years, finishing about 8,000 years ago, with atmospheric carbon dioxide increasing to 280 parts per million. Currently, atmospheric carbon dioxide is over 400 parts per million. We know that there is a strong linkage between temperature and the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They increase together and they decrease together. We also know that carbon dioxide has not been as high as it is currently for at least the past two million years since the ice ages started, well before humans were roaming the Earth. Additionally, ice core records and other paleoclimactic records tell us that the deglacial interval was not a period of constant warming, but one with extreme cooling event called the Younger Dryas, when temperatures in Greenland dropped in a few decades to almost full glacial temperatures for 1,200 years, due to rapid freshwater runoff from the melting ice sheets into the North Atlantic. The Younger Dryas occurred from 12,900 to 11,700 years ago with colder, drier conditions, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, and has been linked to mass extinctions of woolly mammoths, saber-toothed tigers, and other large mammals in North America and Eurasia. Also, some researchers suggest that the start of agriculture in the Eastern Mediterranean occurred during the Younger Dryas, as game became scarce. This event is considered natural climate variability. In my research, I examine climactic variability in the Gulf of Mexico, Caribbean, and the tropical Pacific using large boulder-shaped corals that live for 300 to 400 years. What I've learned from these records is that for every location I have worked in, there are different types of climate variations before the 20th century, but all have a similar warming trend for the past 100 years. My work in the southwestern tropical Pacific identified shifts in decadal variability with large-scale changes in ocean circulation and precipitation since 1900. My work in the Gulf of Mexico has identified cooling during the Little Ice Age, which lasted from 1300 to 1870 AD, but with some spans of 12 years or less that were as warm as the late 20th century, suggesting that the Gulf of Mexico is highly variable. Understanding this natural climactic variability before industrial forest warming allows climate modelers and scientists to better understand how the Earth's climate system varies with time and space, so they can forecast future climactic changes on regional to global scales. So next time you snorkel a coral reef or cut down a tree or sink your feet deep into a muddy lake, just realize that you're next to an archive of past climate for our planet.